Good day, viewers. Uh, once again, you're welcome to Bene People's Television Online, BPTV. And this is one of your favorite program on the station, talking about uh, our personality of the week. Today we have a guest that you all love to watch. Uh, we have a very special personality, and indeed I will call him a big fish. Right here with me in the studio, this day, listener, I have Professor Wilfred Uji. Professor Wilfred Uji is an educationalist. He is a historian. He is an administrator. And of course, we also call him, those of us that are in the industry, we call him also a journalist because indeed, he is one of us. Um, we are going to be talking generally, generally about uh, uh, Professor Wilfred e. Uji, his career, uh, where he has been, what he has done so far for uh, the education industry in Nigeria, and so on and so forth. My name is Itodo Abakba. I am your anchor on the program, and uh, in the next one hour, we have right here with us, Professor Wilfred Uji. You're welcome, Prof, to Bene People's TV Online. It, uh, it's a pleasure being part of the Bene People's TV Online. Thank you. Um, let's begin this way. Um, let us meet you. Who is Professor Wilfred Uji? Well, that is a very big question. Um, uh, precisely, I was born uh, on 10 December 1965. Uh, to the family of Henri William Ujin and Margaret Ujin, uh, and all of Bahimin, Bemachen, Yonu, Gwe East Local Government of Benin State in Nigeria. And I attended my early primary schools in several places, but graduated my primary secondary school at the LGA Primary School at Alida in 1978. And from there, I enrolled into secondary school education in several places again. I graduated at the Government Comprehensive Secondary School, Nakan, in 1984, the General Certificate in Education, GCEO level. And by 1986, I enrolled at the College of Education and applied for a National Certificate in Education and graduated in 1989. Uh, by 1992, I was at the Bennett State University Department of History. By 1997, I had graduated uh, bachelor's degree honors, second class uppers at the Bennett State University History. And because I came the top of the class and top of the faculty, uh, the university offered me a job, graduate assistant, which I accepted in 1997. I returned back with the Bennett State University where I began a career in academics as a graduate assistant in 1997. And I am happily married uh, to Uji Paulina Achiu. Uh, she's the choir uh, from Cross River State, uh, from the family of Moses, Adian, and Julian and Adian. And we're happily married with many children, you know, of course, uh, seven on the whole, and we're doing well. And so I am a Christian and of the Pentecostal persuasion, if I have to put it that way. Uh, I double up also as a minister of the gospel under the Redeemed Christian Church of God and under the a Living Hope area, you know, and but right now, um, back last year, you know, where uh, I am a lecturer at the Federal University of Lafayette in the Department of History and International Studies. But briefly, this is just me, Uji Wifred Telemo. Thank you very much. Um, from your brief background, um, you are an educationalist. You've been a lecturer for about two decades or more now, and uh, uh, 
of course, an associate professor, if I am not mistaken. Um, let's, um, can you give us your own assessment of the educational system in Nigeria? What has been the challenges so far? I think some time ago we had this uh, program on eight year, and they were looking at um, the challenges of our uh, education today in Nigeria, and we're able to bear our minds clear on this issue. Nigeria, like many other countries in the world, were colonized by Britain, the European nation. And one of the things we inherited from the colonial past was an educational system that was not primarily designed to solve our national problem, create work, create jobs, make people self-reliant and self-dependent. Rather, it was an educational system that was designed to help produce clerks, administrators for the colonial system, a kind of educational system that made us over-dependent on the state, on government, for what is called white-collar job. If we, as a matter of fact, it was a kind of education that, rather than enslaving, enslaving in the sense that you were educated or literate, if you have to put it that way, but you knew little or nothing or how to you engage your environment, the, the potential human and natural resources, and to utilize them uh, for productive purposes. And so it was maybe just education for the sake of literacy. When Nigeria became independent in 1960, 1960 to the 70s, precisely attempts were being made you know, to put in place what was known as a Nigerian education system. We realized that the colonial past, you know, did not give us the kind of education that was that would help us, you know, produce what we needed. And so, under the national policy of education, many things came up under that, you know, framework. But just to summarize, that Nigeria realized that for Nigeria to be here, the great dream we were thinking that this nation was going to be here by 2020, alongside with other great nations like Brazil. Japan, um, uh, Korea, and ETC. We needed an educational system in you know, order to help us produce what we needed. In other words, a science and technical education, the skills uh, oriented where an average graduate of a school should be able to engage its environment and utilize the potentials within the environment to reproduce his or her material livelihood. So under the national policy of education, the central focus was mostly on you know, the kind of education that equips the, 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 the graduate with skills you know, that will help you in dealing with the environment, produce that which is relevant to you within your own given environment. The experience was taken from the Western European nations, you know, the, the lessons of industrialization, and perhaps it was assumed that if we can produce people with the ability to engage or domesticate their natural environment, perhaps that was going to lead some level to some level of industrialization, uh, greater private sector participation, reduce this over-dependence on white-collar job, create what you may call the blue-collar job, and of course, help also create wealth in, our, in Nigeria. And so, uh, also, it was also assumed that maybe some other countries, most especially the Asian Tigers, also took this part in their development. Take a look at the educational system and said, for instance, Japan, China, some of these Asian nations decided that well, it was better to focus on science, technical, education. Though some other aspects of education also are very important, but the kind of education that will help you produce your material livelihood. And so we brought in that system of education. It was revised, the national policy on education was revised in the 1980s. And it is out of that that you now have what was known as the 6334 system of education that is operational now, or what sometimes we refer to as the basic nine, you know, six years in the primary school, three years in the junior secondary school, so that is basic nine. Then three years of a, a senior secondary school, then four years in the university. So the whole idea was that under the basic nine, what you call basic education, you have 
the junior secondary school you know technical and vocational skills acquisition the kind of education that we have the individual that at the basic school level you are able to know who you are discover who you are be able to apply your potentials and being able to also to apply yourself to the process of production in other words at the end of your basic nine you should be self-supporting self-reliant in such a way that you should be able to put together whatever that can help you sustain your livelihood but as it were you know so good this policy is and so brilliant it is it has been marred by a lot of challenges in terms of the implementation process and um, we have been able to to see you know the light of the day in terms of realizing the objectives of this kind of system of education but basically you know what nigeria is trying to do now everywhere is to see how we can redesign our educational system to be more pragmatic to be more functional direct that is, you know uh, relates to our needs you know directly so at the university level at the tertiary education level and even at the senior secondary school level there are more emphasis now on entrepreneurial skills entrepreneurial driven education that let's bring in entrepreneurial studies in our school system you know the colleges the universities you know so that you learn at least a skill that at the end of the day when you're out of the university system or you're out of the college or whatever you can fall back to your skill you don't really need to say what uh, let government provide a job and until government will provide a job you're hanging you know so that is on now but this is also this also has its own peculiar you know challenges and i will always say this at every uh, program that the reason why the educational system in nigeria is not working the way it ought to be you know has to do with the nature and the character of our politics recently I was appointed executive secretary in Benin State. Yeah, we'll be coming you know, to that. We'll come to that. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 you know, the right, way so. we do politics in yes. be, in yes. Nigeria yes. generally yes. is a problem. Yeah. One, the kind of politics that emphasizes more of primitive accumulation yes. rather than development. Two, is a kind of politics that is not based on merit yeah. and excellence. Always say that it's very rare in Nigeria for anybody to be rewarded on the basis of merit and excellence. You know, Turin is a kind of politics that's more focused on ethnicity, <laughs> you know, than citizenship. Mm -hmm. It's more focused on religion. It mobilizes religion, mobilizes ethnicity as a vehicle in achieving the kind of thing that we do. You know, so it is politics that is far from issues of development, the objective issues in our society. And given this kind of background, the kind of politics we play in Nigeria, our educational system has remained where it is for a long time, and our leaders have been unable to give serious attention to that sector. Yes, I thought, uh, could we link that to the frequent uh, uh, strikes in the university system that has almost bring the, brought the system to its new? Yeah, like I was saying, I used to say it again and again that and in the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1970s, our universities were as best, as good as any universities across the world. Our lecturers were always on summer holidays and summer courses across Europe and America. You know, we had lecturers that came in from America and Europe who were also part of our university system. As a matter of fact, our university systems were the fulcrum of international attention. But from the 80s and the 90s, that has disappeared completely. Why? Because of the, the increased militarization of the Nigerian polity, beginning from General Ibrahim Babangida, paid very less attention to the university system, rather suppressed the intellectual class, and even killed some. You know, so universities now began to go down, and of course the welfare of university lecturers also began to go down. That, uh, by the 1970s in Nigeria, the salary of a professor was the same to the salary of the head of state. No professor of a Nigerian university had to leave the university, the ivory tower, for a political appointment. But of course, you know what that is now, because that whole thing has collapsed over time. So successive military administration, particularly Sani Abacha and so on, gave very little attention to you know, the sustenance of the university system in Nigeria. So that has collapsed over time. 
and it's being made worse, like I said, by the, by, the, by, the, by the political elites and the kind of ideas they hold, what they believe that should be, you know, the values of the Nigerian system. You know, so the university system, the college system, and even the secondary schools have collapsed, you know, over time because nobody really pays attention to that. The one other major factor has been the fact that the discovery of oil in the 1950s up to the 1960s and oil taking a center stage, you know, in terms of our foreign income earning. I tell you that everybody believes and depends more on this, the sharing of the national cake. Instead of learning how we can bake the national cake and what we can do. And even with oil, what is happening in the oil industry is that multinationals drill this, the, the resources raw, you know, export it, then of course uh, translate that into finished product, it has the petrol, the kerosene and ETC, and then sell it back to us again. We still lack a capacity you know, to deal with the oil industry and to be, sus to be sustaining you know, in terms of being supportive as a nation, you know, in, in, in terms of how we produce the oil resources. You know, so for several reasons, the university system and of course the college system in Nigeria has gone down, you know, over time, a total neglect. Some people blame it on policies of the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, you know, emphasis that one, what we need is a basic education. It's not a tertiary institution. I mean, education. Remember, somebody in Nigeria forgotten and came out clean and said that university education is not meant for everybody. You know, so what we need is a basic functional literacy. But like I did say, that if we had gotten that right at the basic education level, yes, perhaps after basic education, you know exactly what you want. You may not need a university. But that total neglect has been there over time and affected the educational system overall. Uh, yeah, um, uh, as a result of your vast um, experience and training in the education system in Nigeria, uh, four years back or thereabout, you were appointed as the executive secretary of a, a teaching service board in Benue State. What uh, will you say you have, you brought in, and um, what were, were your challenges? Yeah, the challenges and the achievements go together. First, let me say that. Uh, this is one appointment that as when I was appointed in 2016, I, I was unable to clearly see what the challenges ought to be. But one of my first, uh, uh, I wouldn't say disappointment, but of course shock, was that I came in with a strategy plan and I thought that, yes, uh, you had a society in Benue State, I mean the, the, the political ruling class, that was quite concerned about the prospects of secondary school education and what can be done about it in turning it around. So nobody was interested in the, in the strategy plan of a 10. I observed from the early, very early, from the early beginning that what was more central, you know, to the political ruling class, it was one, your ability to, to galvanize votes, your ability to capture votes, your ability to be political relevant. You know, these were the issues, and of course, some other issues about red tapism and bureaucracy. I will explain a little. Parastators function in such a way that they implement, you know, policies. Ministries supervise policies. But I met a situation where I, it was rather unfortunate that everything was turned upside down in such a way that the, the ministry, in all practical terms, you know, did the functions of the power station. And of course, from the commissioner to the permanent secretaries and directors, you know, literally we come down and perform the duties of an executive secretary. And I felt that wasn't right. Yeah, if let, you let's, look, let's, get, if, uh, if you, let's get you clear on this, Prof. Yes, sir. That um, the ministry, which is supposed to be the supervising uh, uh, ministry, so to say, yeah. Uh, come down to the parastatas to implement uh, policies. How does, how, uh, how does that, uh, how did that, it work that way? Yeah, they, it sounds a little bit strange, but at the federal level, if you look at what goes on at the federal level, you understand the relations between a parastatum and the a ministry. ministry yeah. Perhaps in Benue State, that is what we had. That is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I say honestly, it was rather unfortunate. Mm. It was not, it is not, it wasn't just the teaching service board alone. It cuts across all of the parastatum. 
you, you, you find a commissioner doing the job of all the executive secretaries and executive chairman under Paris Tatum. And so you wonder, why were they even appointed in the first place? Why don't you just have a commissioner that does everything together with permanent secretaries and directors? You know, but I also realize you know, that because in many of the parastators, this is funny, mm -hmm. this is funny, right? That that is where you know funds came in, either funds from international donors, international agencies, private organizations, and so on. And these funds were in millions of dollars, you know. And so yeah. they, I could understand why that attention was there. And so all of a sudden, the executive secretary or the executive chairman will be seen too small, quote unquote, yeah. you know, to, to, to hold such a responsibility and to perform such a task. And I said, no, we must get it right. You know, executive secretaries are technocrats. This is one mistake I see Beno State do again and again. Yeah. Now that I'm out, I can say certain things freely. I've watched what has happened at Suburb again and again. Bring in a technocrat, somebody who you know, is a professional, an expert in the field, and ask the person for a blueprint. What is it that you can do to translate this sector? And I can say at this platform that the Dr. Yochi you led transitional committee in, in Benue State, observed all of these things, reports were gathered, you know, and of course came out with a brilliant recommendation in that direction. If you look at the recommendations, they are wonderful. If implemented, I bet you, many of the parasitators will stand on their feet and will do very well under a purposeful leadership, I mean. You know, so, but somehow, well, the bureaucracy in Benin State felt that, well, this is rubbish. You know, we own the ministries, we own the parasitators. That is the thinking. And so why do we need a Dr. Yochi Ayu's recommendation, you know, recommendation, a transitional committee report? So that has been thrown through the back door, and I bet you that is going to create a lot of crisis you know, for several parasitators in Benin State. The second you know, challenge that I saw clearly is that you know, politics must be separated from good governance. And I can explain this clearly. I said it from the beginning. Because the, the, the politician wants you to give him money. And if you don't give what they call stomach infrastructure, you know, yeah. it's one phrase that I met in Benway State. And once you don't patronize the stomach infrastructure, these politicians can blackmail you. And before you know, well, you can be removed, you know, from your seat. But I think issues of good governance are objective issues. Should be, has to do with performance, ability, you know, ideas, visions. And I've always believed Governor Samuel Oton when he says that, you know, he believes in idea, and the man with the superiority of idea should be allowed, you know, to provide leadership. You know, but that is so different in practice, you know, what you see on ground. You know, so the, the, the kind of politics that exists here is that, you see, if you don't patronize the political class, you stand very little chance in succeeding what you're doing. Nobody asks you, nobody asks you that. What are you doing? What are your achievements? What are your challenges? You know, what is the way forward? In my near four years as the teaching service board, no, politi no politician ever asked me that question. Not even my constituents said, look, what are your challenges? Despite whatever that I saw, we're able to do certain things to transform the teaching service, but most especially, you know, the secondary school system in Beno State. One, there's a legal said I've left there, the administrative block. We renovated that, and it's fantastic. You know, of, of course, we furnished everything, and of course, it's looking good. Two, we say in our secondary schools, the culture of reading, the culture of writing had gone down, and that is why many of our students performed poorly. We introduced you know, the culture of preps, afternoon preps for secondary schools, day systems, and then night preps for, for, for the body systems. You know, we introduce reading competitions, quiz competitions, many of these extracurricular activities in our secondary schools to improve on our secondary school system. We brought in training. We even went into a partnership with Google, a multinational global outfit, you know, on digital skills education in our secondary schools. You know, so long we open up our teachers to, you know, innovations in ICT, you know, to help them sit up. You know, these were certain things that we did. And I can tell you, I've always said this, that in 2016 when I came in, no secondary school in Benue State was among the top 100. 
But by the time I left in April of this year, 2020, you know, at least you could find several schools in Benin State among the top 15 schools in Nigeria. That was a remarkable achievement that we made. And then our schools went into national and international competitions and did very well. Our students won several of these national and international competitions. Our teachers also were doing very well in national competitions. These were glowing tributes, testimonies that the school system, the secondary school system in Benin State was beginning to respond to national challenges and was beginning to do very well that could even compete with other schools across Nigeria. The Google program, for instance, Benin State was one of the rare states of all states in Nigeria that received that offer. This is something we did for Benin State. Very few states got that opportunity. Lagos, for instance, got that opportunity. Benue State in the whole of North Central Nigeria. These were outstanding things that we did in order to rescue the system. You know, we also looked at the issues of professionalism among teachers. When I came in, I observed that teachers would come to class without a lesson plan, without lesson notes, without weekly diaries. And I raised a fundamental question. I said, what is it that distinguishes a teacher, you know, from a doctor, from an engineer, from a lawyer. And I ask this question, is it possible for a lawyer to attend a course session without his basic books, you know, be, without a constitution? You know, and of course, you know, the answer was in the affirmative. So I say that no teacher can appear in a classroom without a lesson note, without a lesson plan and ETC. We, we took teaching back to its professional basics, you know, and of course made it worthwhile. You know, so, but despite some of these achievements, you know, that we made us several, even in sports development, grassroots sports, the all secondary school games that had almost died in Benue State for a long time, we were able to revive all of that. Remember that, you know, all secondary schools were the fulcrum of sport development that recruited national stars. We did a lot. Despite this, we still had challenges. Yes, um, so many achievements despite the challenges uh, you had, uh, most especially arm twisting, uh, political inter interference, and in fact, uh, from what you're saying, it's like you were like a, a figurehead. Uh, could that uh, uh, be the reason for your abrupt uh, resignation, so to say? Uh, because I, uh, I understand you, your tenure uh, did not expire before you left abruptly. And uh, there are also accusations that you didn't even leave a, 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 a handover note. First and foremost, I gave my handover notes to the new executive secretary, Dr. Frank Kungu. I said, let me use this platform to congratulate him on his appointment, and I wish him the best. I reached in on a, on a telephone call, prepared my handover notes, and gave them to him. You know, the reasons for my resignation were more professional. You know, one, I've cited it in our discussion already. We had a system that was upside down and, of course, wasn't meant for productivity. That way you waste effort, time, and energy. You get nothing out of it. And then but basically, like I said in my letter of disengagement, you know, that I needed to be back to the university and do certain things professionally. I'm happy Governor Samuel Otom approved that and I've been able to receive a letter of commendation from him, you know, acknowledging my disengagement and, of course, appreciating whatever that I did and wishing me well in my future endeavor. That also was around, announced over, you know, on Radio Benin. All of the controversies that surrounded that, uh, whether so-called resignation or whatever, these were politics, the political issues that you remember that I talked about. I said this is very, very common in a state like Benue State. All of that place I want us to put behind us. They are not issues we should bring in here. Whatever, and do I say allegations or accusations, this is also part of politics. You know, our politics is just that way. For me, I had a good tenure, and I'm glad I served the people of Benue State. You know, I made up my four years, a few months to go. The process of re-engagement with my university is a long process. I say that in my letter of disengagement. You know, you need to go back, apply, do a lot of things for you to be accepted back by your university. It's not just something that will come overnight. 
you need time. It's a process. So I'm happy that I, the government of Benue State under Governor Samuel Oton gave me an opportunity to serve. I appreciate the Benue people. I am grateful. I'm always available for service in our next time. But for now, is to focus on my academic career. That is my primary constituencies and to see how I can reach the peak of my professional development. So, yeah, your hunger to go back to the classroom. That, uh, uh, from what you're saying, has been your reason for your abrupt uh, disengagement from the Benin State government. Um, recently, uh, a few days back, uh, there was, um, there was a, a write-up on the social media that's also generating another hit. Uh, you made a response to the um, uh, a press briefing by the Commissioner of Education and uh, you made some accusations, uh, made some clarifications and and, uh, and uh, accusations, so to say. Can you throw more light on that? Yeah, that is what I said. That is all of the kind of politics, bad politics that went into my exit from the teaching service. But let me say this. The Honorable Commissioner to have called a press conference on a resignation is something that is out of ethics completely as far as public service is concerned. Anywhere in the world, when you resign, you explain why you resign, which I did initially on the social media. That is personal to me. For him to have called a press conference and, of course, made very serious allegations on a personality like me, it was something out of place. I was left with no choice but to reply him. You know, that is, that is a conventional practice in the media. I'm happy you're a journalist, you understand what I mean. You know, without that kind of reply, people can assume that whatever that was said about you is that way. You know, so whatever issues that I raised in that press release to you, you know, were based on some initial facts I had gathered as the executive secretary of the teaching service board. And let me say this clearly that I am not against the government of Governor Samuel Oton. Professor Dennis Tiayab is a public appointee, just like any other person, just like I am. And if he's found wanting in that office, for one reason or the other, he should also be faced or made to face what is the law, the rightful thing to do. You know, I mean, true full support of Governor Samuel Oton as a person and his administration. If there are issues that can make his administration go down, it is our responsibility collectively to let the governor know that there are issues that he needs to take a look at. And in that press release, that's exactly what I did. I reinstated my stand that the governor should take a look at those issues to make education better in Benue State. Right, I'm away from that, let's talk about um, the novel disease called um, coronavirus, also known as uh, COVID-19 that is ravaging the world today. As a historian, do you see any historic link to COVID-19? Yeah, well, uh, incidentally, I studied migrations. And of course, I did a lot of research on migrations and come to discover there's a lot of deal of relations between human migration and the globalization of certain diseases. And so this is not the first time that this is beginning to appear in the, the history of uh, the human race. Uh, if you go as far back as the 14th and the 15th century, European contacts with Africans and of course European contacts with uh, Indian, uh, the, the Red Indians in America. Syphilis, gonorrhea was that outcome, you understand? Yeah. Human contact will always create certain problems. You know, genetically, we're a little bit different here and there. But our environment also carries along certain liabilities. And by the time you meet with certain people, you're definitely going to pass certain things across. You know, so HIV, AIDS also sprang up from that kind of background, you know, migration and contact across the world. And we know that it became a disaster, you know, globally for everybody. Without human migration and contact, it's difficult for certain diseases to be spread as fast as they do. We're living in a global village today where people migrate in, 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 in a twinkling of an eye, the speed of lightning in and across the globe, crisscrossing for business and political reasons. It's so easy for us to pick certain viruses or whatever, and of course export them to other parts of the world, good or bad. You know, human migration is the challenge we face today. I think Nigeria, Nigeria the National Center for 
on uh, National Center for Humanitarian Disasters, Migration and Refugee. These are areas to focus on to see how we can not curb migration, but how we can refine migration. We, I think we, we, we should be able to put in place more proactive measures now. COVID-19 is not going to be the last, it's not going to be the least. It's just an eye opener for us to see there are going to be more dangers for humanity as we live together on this global planet called the Earth. You know, so we must devise ways by which we can monitor ourselves, check ourselves, and introduce you know, checks and balances to minimize certain things. And of course, migration is not just a human thing. Also has to do with animals, mind you. Fishes migrating across continents, birds as well, and it is seen. And of course, the dangers are there. But we are the product of a human survival syndrome that interacts in a very violent manner that produces the kind of effects that we see. And of course, human migration is now being taken to, you know, what you call it, uh, almost on a universal basis. Uh, space rockets to the moon, you know, you know, exploration of other planets of the Earth, I mean of the universe and it is in and so on. We're expanding the horizon and we don't know what the expansion of this kind of horizon is going to cause us in terms of diseases. But well, back home in Nigeria, we must take COVID-19 seriously. I think so far we're playing politics with it here and there, you know, because of the dollars that are involved. The, the usual thing that I say about the political class in Nigeria, that we're more focused or more concerned about what we can make than what we can do in terms of saving the people, making the people better. And so we should be honest with the monies that have come in to make sure that, you know, the lockdown, people have enough in terms of money and food supply for a lockdown. Of course, social distancing, and of course, isolation, and many other practices that can help sanitizers put in public places. Of course, even the, you know, the face, marks. the face marks and all of those things being supplied people. So far, we play politics with the whole thing. You know, we, unless we sit up very drastically, and of course, we begin to address this disaster in a very serious manner, we might risk a pandemic. China played it down at the initial stages, the same thing even with Italy, and they paid dearly for it. Even right now in China, the, 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 the epidemic is coming back gradually again. Numbers of people tested positive, and it is so. This is something not to play politics with. We play politics with everything, including our educational system, like we said. But we play politics with, with diseases, the kind of globalization of pandemics that are beginning to occur. You know, the population in Nigeria may be wiped out completely. But we pray that that shouldn't be so. And then lastly, I've always said this personally, that I believe the COVID-19 pandemic is God's own way of trying to help humanity return back to him. This should be sober moments, moments of reflection, where we can withdraw back and begin to pray and ask God to really help us as a people. My brother, me, I believe that, look, there is no existence outside, you know, God. It may sound so absurd, you know, but this issue is beyond us. It's beyond science. It's beyond technology. It's beyond economy. The greatest nations of the world, the most powerful, the most scientific, are all affected. We need to look up to God and ask that God see us through in this challenge. Thank you very much. Um, on a final too. note, um, politicians blowing politics with everything including COVID-19. Um, as a teacher, a great teacher, one who is listening to, um, what do you have to say to the common man as a politician plays politics with COVID-19? The common man, the, the, my, my simple advice is that love yourself, love each other. Don't allow politicians to divide you. Divide you. They are the ones good at dividing us anyway. You know, and use common sense, use common sense. And of course, obey instructions. Don't take things for granted at all. God is on our side. You know, God helping us will overcome every challenge in this our Niger. Thank you very much. Thank you, my brother. Um, mm -hmm. Viewers, the first past one hour or thereabout, we've been discussing uh, very serious issues with uh, Professor Wilfred Uji, an educationalist, an administrator, uh, a man of God, and of course, a friend of the people. Uh, Professor Uji would like to say thank you very much for coming to B 
the New People's Television online. And we hope that when we invite you next time, you will oblige us. I love this project. You know, thank you too. It's a pleasure.